G'day fellas and welcome to a build order breakdown for the Japanese. In this video we're going to be taking a look at Vortex up against Puppy Paw, two of the world's best players with Vortex on the Japanese. This build order is going to be the Japanese Fast Castle. We're going to be going through every single step that you need to know as you go along with this strategy. It is one of the best strategies to one trick pony all your way up to Conqueror. So let's get into it. Starting off all villagers immediately out over to Berries. You don't have to do this little TC pop. It's very cute saves you a couple seconds don't worry just right click out on the berries two villagers are going to build your farmhouse you're going to make sure that you get it nice and snug up against the berry bushes and all the other villagers are going to go out there the reason we use two villagers is because if we only use one they're not going to be able to collect uh in time and subsequently they'll run back to the town center here we're also going to be looking to pick up immediately our tawara upgrade which is going to buff up our gather speed it actually makes it faster than sheep it actually makes it about as far as fast as deer uh, if i remember correctly so from here, we've got seven villagers out over on berries. We rallied one out over to that berry bush. Now we're going to be looking to rally three villagers out over onto gold. So dropping down our forge out here, which doubles as our blacksmith. With regard to our scout, we've sent it out into the middle of the map and we're looking for sheep. It's pretty simple in the early game. There's not too much complexity to this opening and we want to be spending most of our time watching our scout. Meanwhile, so what, what we can do is we can hotkey our scout. We can give it control group one. We can give our town center control group five. And what that means is we can be watching our scout while at the same time selecting five and queuing a villager in the town center. So you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of that and mainly just looking for sheep. Now, one of the things to note is that this strategy is very good for one tricking. What does that mean? Well, whenever I'm coaching over on Patreon, if you'd like to check it out, I'll leave a link in the description if you want to improve. One of the big things that I talk about is sticking to one civilization and sticking to one strategy, sticking to one type of map. It's part of the reason why I always say you want to be banning uh, maps that are water-based because you just want to be focusing on land and looking to master that. So once you've mastered that then you can look to branch out into different things so th this is part of the reason why one tricking is a really really smart move and there is no better strategy in civilization to do it with than the japanese it is incredibly strong so now that you've got your three villages out on gold you're going to start rallying your town center uh, to your sheep villages and these villages are, are intentionally going onto the sheep not going onto the berries and that is because we need these villagers on the sheep because they're going to be our age up villagers so it's very intentional exactly what vortex has done now i'm also going to mention here that this is a game from the elite classic too so if you'd like to check that out this weekend 15 gmt saturday and sunday uh, i'll be over there casting the grand finals and the semi-finals but uh, i won't be doing any other days so you'll have to double check exactly what days those are but we're going to continue rallying now to the sheep. We've got three vills on sheep. And what we're going to be looking for is the, Kur the Kura storehouse. And we're going to be putting it on the wood line. This is really important because the Kura storehouse doubles as a resource drop-off uh, building. And that basically means we don't have to make a lumber camp. And that's good because it means that we save resources. Another thing to note is that with this strategy, this is a really good strategy against any kind of early aggression. Uh, but it will be quite weak to the Mongols because the Mongols are looking to strike right about now. And if that is the case, do not worry. There is still a plan in place uh, because as you can see, this is a really good tower position right here. Not only do you hit the berries, uh, but you also hit the gold. Uh, and we'll talk about exactly what to do in the event that that happens. But we'll focus on exactly what Vortex is doing here. So four villagers are going to be working on the landmark and now the town center will begin to rally out towards the the trees. One of the reasons I really like this build order is because you don't have to move villagers around. Those first seven villagers that went out over onto berries, they're still out there over on berries. The three villas that were out on gold, they're still out there on gold. So you don't have to think too much about that. You can focus a lot on your scout and where those next villagers are coming out. So we're going to continue rallying up to five villagers here on wood. We're going to just start with stragglers. But once we've got our Kura storehouse up, we're going to make sure that we bring these villagers over just because there's a little bit less walking distance. Now, one of the things to note as well is that Vortex is up against an aggressive civilization here, up against Joan of Arc, who are notorious for their early aggression. So we'll have to keep that in mind as the replay continues on. Next house is coming up here for Vortex, intentionally placing it within the uh, line of sight or within the attack range of the town center, but also still close to these berries so that it means that he'll be able to drop off a little bit closer have that shorter distance four minutes and eight seconds now for his opponent's age up so we'll be expecting that enemy through soon keep in mind that school of cavalry of course is going to mean that uh, well the enemy can produce knights straight away 
There's that fifth villager now coming out over onto wood. And you can see that these villagers, once they, they are rallied so that once they finish the wild oak tree, they will immediately move out over towards this position. Now from here, Vortex is going to take two villagers and send them over onto gold. And then he's going to take two of his other villagers. So we can see them down here and bring them back onto sheep. He's also going to rally onto sheep. Five villagers out over onto wood. And now here with our five villagers over on gold, we've got enough wood that we can put down an outpost. So now what's, what's happening? Vortex is looking to put the outpost down in a position that's going to guarantee he's got a really nice defensive curve here. It means that if there was, say, if you're up against the English and they were thinking about going for longbows, well, congratulations, this is going to stop them in their tracks. Now, one of the other things, I'm just going to pause it because I want to talk about this. One of the reasons why this build order is so smart is because when it comes to food, Vortex has done a great job at conserving the food. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. When it comes to your food, you've got a set amount of food that you can use. You've got your berries that are in your base. You've got deer that are around your base. And you've got your sheep, which are typically under your, underneath your town center. You've also got access to farms as well. So what Vortex has done is he's taken advantage of the berry bushes as early as he possibly can. He's looked to go for the Tawara upgrade very, very early, which has increased the gather rate. And it means that if the enemy was now to come and put pressure on this berry bush, that it wouldn't matter that much to him because he's already taken pretty much all of the value from this berry bush and converted it into his resource bank. And he's saved the sheep for now. So this allows him to have a very flexible castle age because... As, as a result of doing this, it almost guarantees that he will get up as long as his gold stays safe. But gold is not always safe. Not to knights and definitely not to outposts, which are about to go up. Joan of Arc is beginning to move forward here. And you can see she's going to be very careful about where she goes because that outpost has got quite a bit of range on it. But the good thing about outposts is if you get one up in the pixel perfect spot where the enemy outpost can't quite hit it, and, and even though the, you can see this, uh, range up here. This is incorrect. You can't actually hit this far. You could probably hit to about here. Um, so because of that, what it's going to mean is that Joan of Arc is uh, not able to be hit. But once these knights come through and jump, the villagers jump inside the outpost, Puppy Boy is going to find out the hard way that arrow slits are now through. And keep in mind that arrow slits are through because of that Japanese bonus. That Japanese bonus that we drop off stone every time we drop off gold and vice versa. So... It's, I think, 50 stone that it took to get this uh, outpost up or the uh, rather the um, emplacement up. And it's essentially come through for free, right? Because we've got that lovely Japanese bonus. Now we're looking to continue adding villagers onto farms. We're taking advantage of that food. We pulled all of our villagers off berries and we're just watching our gold at the moment uh, because we need to make sure that our villagers don't die to the Royal Knight. A little bit of scouting's coming out here as well. We can see that Vortex is spotting out what his opponent is up to. He's being a little bit cheeky here. He's going to lure the boar down to his opponent, you know, helping him out, saying, hey, uh, puppy paw, I, I know that you uh, wanted to get the boar, so I brought it in nice and close for you, and you can see exactly what's going to happen here. We got ourselves a little bit of a fiesta. Look, this isn't that relevant to uh, to the build order, but it definitely is interesting to see what happens here as the boar is notorious for how much damage it can put out, and you can see that Vortex is causing an absolute shamozzle over on this side of the map and uh, look i'll spoil it for you he kills the villager and the scout survives let's focus a little bit more on this build order though and see exactly what's happening so underneath the town center we have got a lot of safe villagers on top of that the villagers that are up towards this top side they are safe as well because this is a beautiful position here by the of, of this outpost just guarantees that he is going to be safe from this angle with no real issue an outpost is now going to be thrown down on the other side as well and that's because five villagers oh gotta be careful here I don't think he's lost any villagers. He might, might have taken a hit or two, uh, but uh, he will be now moving out five villagers. So just as he's about to age up a little bit shy of that, he will be moving those villagers out over to gold. It's important to note that he's just been rallying to food this entire time. He's got plenty of sheep underneath the town center. He's got... Anytime a farm pops up, you want to make sure that you are taking advantage of that and looking to try and get your villagers onto the farms as quickly as possible. When it comes to the farmhouses, don't worry too much about their positioning. Just try and keep them in the same, um, the same grid as your... Um, as your farms so try and try and always line them up you don't want to crisscross them or anything like that so now we'll be looking for the floating gate floating gate is very intentionally placed in this position always look to try and place your kura storehouse on one side of your town center uh next immediately adjacent to the wood line and then on the opposite side look to have that floating gate come down and this is because your opponent's going to have a difficult time stopping these villagers from constructing this landmark we're now starting to see the stable go up. A lot of villagers are on gold. The double outpost is up here as well, which means that if the knights try and come through here, 
you're going to see a difficult time for them because all of these villagers will be safe. Even though there's a couple in there that are low health, they should be able to survive any real threat that comes in. And we can see that knight now looking towards that top side again. The scout's going to be here as well, spotting it out. And now we enter phase two of this build order. And this is where it starts to get scary because from here... You can be a little bit flexible, but I would advise just follow exactly what Vortex is doing in your games. If you want to climb, just follow this pretty much to a T. It is all you need to do. So immediately, he looks to put the first Yorashiro inside the stable. After that, he's going to look to start training Mounted Samurai. They're going to take 12 seconds for each one to build. That is really, really quick. And what he's going to do is use that Mounted Samurai to buy him space, and then he's going to look to pick up relics. So he's going to start with his closest relic. He's got plenty of wood in the bank because he's had these, these villagers on wood the entire time. And he's going to be able to drop that relic inside the Shinto Shrine immediately. We can see the Mounted Samurai is going to be preparing uh, for any kind of knight that are, that are out here. And we'll be able to tank it up. We'll be able to dive in. On the other side of the map, the Scout did go down. But we do see a barracks that is coming out, which gives us a little bit of foreshadowing as to what the plan is for Puppy Paw. He's on two TCs. We know that much. We know he's got a barracks. So it means that we're going to see some spearmen shortly but don't let that alarm you remember the great thing about mounted samurai is if you see spearmen you can just run away you don't have to fight them so now vortex is going to start moving out over onto the map he's going to look to keep these mounted samurai together but remember the goal behind this is to continue picking up relics so he's going to be looking to try and secure these, these relics we can see he's rallying towards this position wants to make sure he clears it out Make sure that there's no knights nearby. Remember that every single uh, two or every two minutes into this game, he's going to be receiving that free Yorishiro. He's going to be receiving that that free uh, Shinto priest, and he can use those to pick up sub subsequent subsequent relics. So there it is, the mounted samurai tanking up a charge from the knight. Actually, I don't even think it tanked up a charge. I don't know what happened there, but it's still got it. It's mounted armor. There's the spears on the top side. And have a look what Vortex does here. This is really smart. You can make a choice, Puppy Paw. You can either choose to go after the Relic or you can choose to go after the Mounted Samurai, which are going to be going to your base. And naturally, Puppy Paw says, well, I guess we've got to go after the Mounted Samurai because we want to make sure that we've got an appropriate defense. He gets a little bit of damage in here to the Royal Knight. But remember, the goal has been achieved. He's picked up the Relic. Meanwhile, behind this, what's happening? All of these new farms that are coming up, he's looking to make sure villagers come onto them. It obviously takes uh, a little bit of time. You know, our attention isn't always there, but we want to make sure that we pick that up. Second Yoroshiro now gets placed in the town center. This is going to mean that he's able to keep up with the second... Ooh, well, not a very good fight right there. I think that might be a couple of dead... Oh, he somehow squeezed out of there. So he's playing with fire right here, but you can see even though he's playing with fire, looks like he's got his fireproof armor on because uh, he's doing a good job of just taking out villagers. We'll manage to get them away, only losing the one mounted samurai there. But let's focus less on the on the action and more on what's happening behind the scenes here. So that's the second relic that's being dropped off. That was the one that was in, in the middle of the map that's only just come back now. Third relic is now going to be rallied up. He's going to be looking to pick this one up so we can see that naturally he's moving towards that top side to cover for the Shinto priest. At the same time, towards the bottom side, that's second Shinto priest that came out. Uh, you can see right there, we've got a royal knight. Uh, but at the same time, that, that second uh, Yoroshiro that was placed into the town center, uh, that Shinto priest is now coming down towards the south side here, and he's looking for those relics. And the mounted samurai is going to be here helping him out. And what do we see? We see a triple archery range. Now think about it from this perspective, okay? Your opponent, he's on two TCs, and he sees you making mounted samurai. So naturally, he's going to start making spearmen. So what do we make to counter the spearmen? A simple archers. Easy. Really, really simple. It's kind of like you're playing the French in a way because you're going knights and archers. Uh, so this is such a smart move from Vortex to, to go into this. And we now see him picking up the fourth relic. Well, technically the third relic. This one here is going to be the fourth relic for him. Uh, but four relics this early on in the game. He's had a, a really, really simple transition so far in this game. Um, and, and things are just going very, very well for him. He's been almost unstoppable. The amount of pressure that he's he's been under, he's managed it very effectively. And that's something that he's just done through decision-making, going for these berries early on, making sure that he's got the outpost on the gold, even if he doesn't know that he's in danger, he suspects he will be. Making sure he doesn't play any games in the sense that when he brings out five extra villagers out here, he just puts the second outpost down just because he knows he wants to make sure he's going to be okay. And now beginning to push forward only five archers. Now, I would say you probably want to push with a few more than that. Maybe, maybe even go up to like 10 just to make sure that you're okay. But you can see that he's able to put on a lot of pressure in this situation. Uh, and he's got really strong units. We've got veterancy on these Yumi archers here. And the mounted samurai, they've got the ability to tank up any of the, that frontline damage that's coming through from the spears. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, we do see the knight is coming through, but he's going to, of course, lock those villagers in and does a great job reacting to it. So 
at, at, at this stage, Vortex is, is pretty much in the driver's seat. There's no two ways about it when we assess what's going on. In fact, let's just do a quick pause. I just want to, before this fight happens, let's turn it into caster mode and have a look at the economies. Because naturally, when you, you see a, a civilization that's on two town centers, you think, okay, this guy's got to be ahead, right? He's been on two TCs since, what, six minutes? So he should be miles ahead. Well, Vortex has managed to kill a couple of villages in this game already. He's taken out five, whereas Puppy Paw's only taken out one. But on top of that, there are other mitigating factors. Most importantly, we've got three relics in the bag. And each relic here is worth about two villagers. So already take that 44 villagers and put that up to, say, 50 villagers. On top of that, you've also got the Yorishiros, uh, which are going to be working in overdrive. And now I, I didn't realize he's actually got one in the farmhouse, which is a bit strange, uh, but I'll give it to him. I'll allow him that one. So the farmhouse Yorishiro is going to be worth, I, if I remember correctly, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's 75 food a minute, which is about two villages, a little bit under two villages. So or, already there, now you're talking 52 villages. He's also capturing a sacred site, which will be 100 gold a minute. That's going to be another two villages. And you can see the way that even though he's on one TC, he's still able to bring his economy up to the equivalent of what his opponent is at. Oh, by the way, we've got the fourth relic in, so add another two villages onto that. Uh, in addition to that, he's also got the Daimyo Manor, which is pumping out villages slightly faster than what his opponent's TCs are. So you can see that even though he's on one TC, even though he's focused on Castle Age, there's still a large element to the economy. Another thing to note is that Vortex is quite heavy on gold. He's got 10 villagers out here and they've remained out here this entire time. Let's bring it back into the regular UI. But one of the things that we, he's been doing is he has been picking up upgrades like a madman. So if we take a look at his mining upgrade, we can see he doesn't have it. Uh, if we take a look at his uh, at his town center, it looks like his town center has been upgraded to the Daimyo Manor, so going up to that level, that second level. Um, but uh, we, we do see plus two is coming through, so we know he's already got plus one. So there are some big upgrades that are coming behind, and that's something that you can do if you're ever floating, if you've got a little bit of gold, which will happen naturally as you get more and more relics, as you get more Yoroshiros into your forges, you're going to have more gold floating. And so naturally, you're going to be able to pick up those upgrades. So make sure that you're looking to do that. Let's continue watching, though. So the Yumi Ashigaru number is starting to look really good here. He's able to actually one-shot out these spears now. And with that, he can just take a fight. And he can pretty much win at this point. And I think even if his opponent has stayed in Feudal Age, he'd still have a very formidable amount of units here. Uh, Men at Arms starting to come out. Ablatria, and you can see that he's going to be able to focus them down on the back line. Meanwhile, behind this, he is just pumping units non-stop, making sure that he doesn't put Yorashiros into the archery ranges. We don't need them in the archery ranges anymore. It's very important on the first stable to put the Yorashiro in there, but after that, you don't really need it at all. The only time you'd ever really substitute it would be deleting the stable and then putting down a siege workshop. That would be understandable. But now, obviously, underneath the town center here, once you start taking out the amount of villagers that Vortex is taking out, that's pretty much the game. Uh, but meanwhile, behind this, it, it's just going to be non-stop pumping units. And this is part of the reason why when Vortex plays games, they typically... This is why I don't cast a lot of Vortex games. They normally end before the 18-minute mark. And this is why. He is just so hyper-aggressive. And this is a, 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 a massive component of why he's so successful. Uh, but as I said, it's part of the reason why I don't cast him because typically I'm looking for those longer games. Um, but this, this strategy right here, the ga game is about to end. This strategy here uh, is an incredible strategy for one tricking. The only real weakness this strategy has is to early aggression. So if you're playing against the English, men at arms on your gold can be difficult to deal with. If you're playing against the Mongols, spearmen on your gold can be difficult to deal with. But the truth is, you should be able to collect enough gold to age up by the time that they get here. The men at arms, maybe not, depending on your spawn. If you've got a front gold and, and, and they, you know, they, they scout it out and they're, they're immediately there, you might have some difficulty. You might need to juggle villages. But if you're up against the Mongols, I said I'd, I'd talk about it a little bit just uh, earlier in the video. So let, let's, let's do that right now. If you're up against the Mongols, you're going to be losing these berries. You're going to be losing this gold. It's important that you remain flexible. So we've got villagers that are gathering up wood. So what are we going to do? We're going to just remain flexible. We're going to do that same thing. This time, we're going to make sure that we come down to another gold. We're going to bring five villagers down here. We're going to put a forge down. And of course, we're going to put an outpost next to it. And that's the idea. And then we're just going to look to try and take advantage there. And putting down outposts like this, double-siding them, guarantees that the Mongol player is not going to be able to get an outpost on one specific side because this is something that happens quite often. If you put a forge here and then you put an outpost here, the Mongol player will just come in and they'll put an outpost right here or right here or right there, wherever they can get it as close as possible and then deny that gold from you. So this is something that you need to be very careful of and something that you need to be thinking about. Try not to panic too much and most importantly, don't change your plan. 
keep on the the road keep w- walking down that road if, if your goal is to fast castle you need to make sure that you get there the question is how, how you get there safely and we want to make sure that we don't overreact don't build rams don't build an archery range don't change your plan just be flexible move down to the secondary gold move down move down to the tertiary gold if you if you have to say that right tertiary 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 move down to the third gold if you have to um, and and just try and keep those villages down there. Make sure that they've got the outpost up. That that's going to be really important. I guess the alternative is that you could try and technically look to gather wood early, but I I, I would probably advise against that. Anyway, we're going to leave it there. That's the build order breakdown for Vortex. This has been the Elite Classic Two, one of the games that were played over in that tournament. I'll leave a link in the description to where you can watch them live this week. And if you've got any questions, leave them down in the comments. I do read through the the comments, uh, and if there's any questions in there, I'll make sure that I'm around, or I'm sure there'll be plenty of other people around as well. Uh, but other than that, we'll we'll call it there. Thank you so much for watching.